Thank you. Now, just trying to get a place where the light is not directly in my eye. <laughs> is it possible to come in up here? Well, it's always a joy to come back to Utah. I first came to the Preston Poly when I was an undergraduate at Lancaster in the very early 70s to hear a lecture on what was then. Now, could you keep the lights bright, please? It's just that br blinding light up there. Put anything just in front of it, perhaps. It's absolutely blinding. Um, it's literally like Venus in transit. <laughs> oh, look at that Venus out of transit. That's it, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And also, I was very, very honoured when, following the death of the late Vincent Baruchus, I was made the honorary president of the Preston and District Society. I have long connections with the area, and of course, to with Utah, who gave me my first honorary degree in 2004. And I also saw the 2004 transit of Venus, but the whole way through, ingress and egress. We saw the beginning of it at the Northfield Hall Observatory and the egress to the porch of Hull Parish Church. So that was a delight. That was 2004. Now, anyway, to the stars from Pendle Hill. I was thinking, particularly coming up on the train today, why Lancashire? Why such extraordinary achievement? Yes, you might say, yes, you're a bit prejudiced, you're a Lancastrian, just admit that. But there's an objective record. Let's start by looking at the county of Lancaster. Back to the days of Jeremiah Horrocks, 1630-1640. It was where they said, the king's writ did not run. It was the wild places. It was what the Romans would have called Ultimae Thule, the back of beyond. And why should it not have been? Look at what was here. Yes, you had the Pennines, and the Pennines sloped between roughly the Pennines and the end of habitation, about 10 miles coming down. And you could have had Lancaster, Preston, Bolton, Salford, Burnley, Bury, those places, all in a fairly sort of sausage shape. Then you would have swung around the river estuary. You would have had Kirkham, Lytham. Then you start going up the coast, Bisham, and Ross Hall. Two words, Ross Hall. The rest of it, bog. <laughs> I own a 1577 speed map of Lancashire, and that is what's on it. What we call mosses, and also marsh areas, and what we as a lad used to call also flashes. Large amounts of buggy, wet terrain. And until they started of draining of that, mainly the 18th and 19th century, not much was here. Blackpool, which I love, and I've loved from childhood. Why do they call Blackpool? Because in the parish vestry minutes of the parish of Bisham, Bispon, as it would later become, it mentioned attempts in about 1710 to drain the black pool. <coughs> Literally, a bog. So why all of this extraordinary intellectual achievement in a place beyond the way? Well, you would have had, yes, a few major towns. Liverpool would be fairly modest size in those days. Ross Hall. And then you'd have seen across Lancashire a series of places referred to as chapels. Chapels which later became towns. The reason being, these were chapels of ease. Small churches for people who lived so far out in the marshes that they couldn't get to their parish churches on Sunday. And so this was what was here. It was not really until the 18th century that much of this bug started to be drained. The 19th century it continues and so on. But you even notice, if you go to Blackpool on the train, as a non-driver uh, uh, such as I do, and at a time when they're not on strike, 
you what's left for a tap. And the train has an enormous great dog's back leg. It's coming to Blackpool now, so you miles out of your way. Why? Because when they built the railway in the 1840s, there was an enormous swamp. <laughs> so the train just went round the swamp. It's now farmland. I asked the question, why therefore is this happening in Lancashire? Why such extraordinary distinction? Now, let's start with, of course, the man after whom this lecture series is named, Jeremiah Horrocks. He was a scouser. He came from Liverpool. And, of course, his connection with Preston seems to have been having done his undergraduate degree at Cambridge, at Emmanuel in Cambridge, never having taken his degree, and needing a job. He comes to live in Machua. His position there is a bit peculiar. He may have been a tutor to the Stone family. He was probably also to, I suspect, a Bible clerk in the church. He was not old enough to be a priest. He was not even old enough to be a deacon. He would probably have been a Bible clerk, a Cambridge-educated young man who could help the local vicar, Latin literate and all the rest of it. That's how he does his astronomy. He picks up his astronomy in Liverpool. And of course, too, he had that great, great key, in addition to having been to Cambridge, which we'll forgive him for. <laughs> he read Latin for it. That is the key language of the day. And there is still preserved in Trinity College, Cambridge Library, a volume of astronomical tables owned by Horrocks. And inside he has a list of something like 32 books he had read up to the age of something like 17. Every one in Latin. No English text mentioned at all. That was the key language of the day. Who else was here? Well, there's his friend William Crabtree in Salford. A few years older. Crabtree, we think, was born in 1612. Horrocks in about 18 or 19. 18, 18 or 19. And well, Crabtree was a young merchant, a cloth merchant, described as a clothier, a man in the textile trade, not probably cotton in those days, probably linen, which is the more common rug used before cotton hit Lancashire in a big way in the 18th century. But he was also highly educated. He also was Latin literate. He'd also read Regimontano, Sentica Brahe, Kepler, Galileo, how did you get Kepler, Galileo, Tycho Brahe, and so on, to bugs in the north? <laughs> it was actually easier than you might think. Although, yes, it was a thinly populated county, it was like maybe 40,000 souls across the whole of Lancashire at that time. Big towns such as Manchester, 5,000. <laughs> Slightly smaller ones, Bolton. 3,000. Preston, about four. But there was always a mercantile connection. I mean, there was endless upping and downing because one of the biggest things in Lancashire, even at that day, were handmade textiles, mainly linens and also to uh, woolens. Like I say, Lancashire was not really a big cotton county until the 18th century. It means that if you had backing and toing and fro with London, Books go along with the way. You might have taken your pack horses to London with bales of cloth on the back, and you might have come back with books, interesting objects, bits of Chinese porcelain to go in the manor houses of the county. And we think this is how it does it. But it's amazing how learned knowledge gets around. And it's not just here, it's Yorkshire, Devon, all over. Yet, as I've been saying, Lancashire somehow pips the lot. Lancashire was a relatively poor county, thinly populated, virtually marginal agriculture. Yet, it produced such genius. Devon, a much, much richer and bigger county, never produced a Jeremiah Horrocks. Yorkshire, yes produced their great friend William Gascoigne, but really that was more or less it. And yet we've produced, especially in the Pendle area, 
a whole horde of these young men who would go on to have major, major influence later. Said Jonas Moore, or Jonas Moore later knighted as Said Jonas, would actually not only come from a lad from the Vale of Pendle, he would later become a friend of King Charles II, he would also be a tutor to the young King Charles II, and with a knighthood at the Restoration. And Sir Jonas Moore's biggest astronomical achievement, he lobbied and established the Greenwich Observatory and paid for the Astronomer Royal's first instrument. Jonas Moore came from the same place where the Pendle Witches come from. And it fascinates me too that we still have today this idea, Lancashire, 17th century, ignorant, superstitious, witches, rubbish! What about the great achievement? Now it's very hard to know what stimulates somebody to be interested in a given subject. But we know what would have been the normal curriculum of that day. Astronomy would have been on both the school and the university curriculum. And Horrocks, I may say, was by no means unique in being a Lancashire village lad to go to Oxbridge. There were other Horrockses we have now found on the lists of Oxford and Cambridge colleges. Because how did it work? How did a local lad from a small town, in fact he came out just from outside Liverpool, a little village, how did they get to university? Scholarships. At that time, all of the Oxford and Cambridge colleges had scholarships on their landed investments. And it would mean too that what would occur is they would admit a certain number of young boys, usually as young as 14, 15, 16, as undergraduates. And they would come, they would be to a local school, a local grammar school. What does a grammar school mean? Where you were taught a Latin grammar. And then you go to university. Leave university and go up in the world into the major learned professions, the church, medicine, the law, the civil service, and so on. This endlessly happens through late medieval Europe into the 17th century and so on. Until really the 19th century it becomes less so, largely because of escalating land value prices that, that in fact what frequently happened is the investments were not well managed and the revenues went down. So you had to take more and more and more fee-paying students to compensate for the lack of generated revenue from endowments. But this is how Horrocks and many, many others like him would have gone to Oxford, Cambridge and so on. When they were there, they would have studied the trivium and the quadrivium. The quadrivium was the mathematical sciences. Astronomy, geometry, arithmetic and music. Music was not how to play the fiddle. Music was rather the harmony of the spheres. That fascination. Why were there the same number of planets as a number of notes on the scale? No, 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 no. Did it mean that there was a divine relationship between the planets, the orbits, and the sky? How did you get to the bottom of this? Mathematics, geometry, and arithmetic, a beautiful tailored package of learning. This is what you would have learned. Yes, you would have worked on the idea of the Earth is at the centre of the universe. Yes, I agree with that. But there are new ideas coming about to suggest it may not be. Yet, bearing in mind that those who liked Copernicus's ideas were not burned, I have to come across no case of any Copernican who was burned or punished, but it just seemed plain daft. Spinning round in space, where were we all flown off? So yes, Copernicus said the ideas were nice and clever and mathematically elegant, but bonkers. <laughs> Basically speaking, it was bonkers. We, we're here, the Earth must be fixed, and a lot more discoveries to show by the early 18th century, a hundred years after Horrocks, that the Earth actually did move in space. But then we have, what about Crabtree? 
himself, a merchant, well traveled, and we know a man who regularly visited London, probably with his wares and his cloth and so on. We know he had connections at Gresham College in London, where I once had the honour of being a, a professor for a short time. Gresham College is what I have called Europe's first institute of adult education. There you could attend lectures on theology, medicine, astronomy, you name it. Free of charge, wandering in off the street and listen. Indeed, the lectures had to be given twice. Once in English and once in Latin for the benefit of overseas visitors who didn't understand English. But also, too, we're told from John Flamsteed and others who were Gresham lecturers as well, anybody could literally walk in. And in fact, in winter, what would sometimes occur? Butchers and butchers' boys would come out with their bloodstained aprons, curl up by the fire and... It was a nice place to sit and get warm. But almost certainly Crabtree would have known those lectures. Almost certainly Horrocks would as well. In other words, there was far more learned knowledge circulating around than we often popularly believe. And literally, even if Butcher's boy could learn it, it could show that other people who were a bit more, shall we say, intellectually switched on than Butcher's boys could learn a great deal at the time that they were there. But the story of the Butcher's boys comes from Flamsteed. It has a real, authentic root. So therefore, we have this group of extraordinary men. The one about Pendle Hill. What was so special about Pendle Hill? The Townley family of Townley Hall and Carl Hall, both in the Vale of Pendle. They were an extraordinary old Lancashire gentry Roman Catholic family. Now, another thing about Lancashire at that time, too, theologically, it had a lot of resident Catholics. People who had simply failed to recognise the Reformation. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, the Townleys, the Shackleys, who I may say owned Stonyhurst, Stonyhurst Hall, were part of them. Now, we are told, of course, the idea that Catholics and Protestants murdered each other whenever you got the chance. No! Horrocks was a devout Anglican. Crabtree was the same. Yet they were friends with Catholic learned gentlemen. With the slightest hint coming through that big surviving correspondence, entertaining each other at Townley Hall and various other places. So we have to bear in mind too that there's a much greater facility there than indeed we often forget. So therefore there's this vital intellectual life. But let's think about the Townleys. There was Richard and Christopher Senior. They themselves were at first what would be called antiquaries. They were collectors of data. And one of the things that especially fascinated Catholic gentry were the ruins in the county. The old abbeys, the old churches that the Reformation had destroyed. What were referred to at the time as, quote, bare ruined choirs bare ruined choirs, the remnants of the great, great churches and monasteries of Lancashire and elsewhere in the country. They had therefore a fascination with the past. But Christopher Townley also was fascinated by astronomy. And indeed he survived the Civil War. His elder brother Richard fell at Marston Moor. And of course one of the Gascoigne family died at Marston Moor too in the same battle. But indeed, what occurs at the Civil War, Cromwell and the Puritans do not, not, not like the Catholics. And their lands are sequestered or taken. He has to move out of Townley Hall, which he gets back later, and Christopher, who survives, has a new address he starts to use on his letters, Carl Hall, Carl Hall, C-A-R-R-E, in the Vale of Pandora. And there he entertains astronomers, mathematicians, and so on, including Jeremiah Horrocks, including William Crabtree, and their Yorkshire Catholic gentry friend, William Gascoigne. So we have a nice, fascinating little club here. There's a surviving letter from Crabtree to Horrocks, to, 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 
told him. And he says, thank you for your wonderful hospitality and the visit you've just had. We've had a wonderful time. And he's seen some of his instruments. Is it possible for you to give me drawings of some of your instruments? Because I'd like to have a set made for myself. So this is real sociability going on. Now, of course, at that time, too, it was impossible for Roman Catholics to go to Oxford or Cambridge, which were very, very Anglican institutions. But they often did, though. They studied abroad. At Jesuit colleges such as St. Omer in Belgium. And it would be St. Omer that would lead to finally Stonyhurst College some years later, but in the early 19th century. So we have this very active, dynamic world. Jeremiah Horrocks is part of a hub of very highly intelligent classical scholars, philosophers, mathematicians, astronomers, and so on. And the key thing is, why were there more of them in this county than there were anywhere else? Because like I said, I don't know such an enormous dynamic body in Devon or Surrey or anywhere like that. Jeremy Shackery, not a name that most people have ever heard of. Lads from the Vale of Pendrum. He became Horrocks and Crabtree's first great prophet. He never knew them personally. He, they died before him. But in the 16th, late 1640s, 1650s, he was part of the entourage of Townley Hall, or what was left of Townley Hall. He was an ungrateful devil, too. He says in one of his letters, all that Mr. Townley gives me is board and lodgings. Why are you ungrateful, little runt? Well, that wasn't bad going, was it? It was a family that was cash strapped as it was anyway. And at first, of course, he's interested in astrology. And he's interested in calculating the... But, you know, here's another lad, mathematically literate, Latin literate, living in the vein of Pendle, 1647. And then, visiting Townley Hall Library, he hits something that changes his life. The Townleys were trying to collect up the manuscripts of Jeremiah Horrocks and William Crabtree. And he reads them. These were literally a St. Paul on the road to Damascus event for him. They swung him round. He abandons astrology. He becomes a Copernican astronomer and an observer. Jeremy Shekhering becomes the first great mouthpiece for Crabtree and Horrocks. He publishes several works, and in those works he is constantly shown the inestimable Mr. Horrocks, the wonderful Mr. Crabtree, all the rest. He is the first person to get their views out there into the big world. And, of course, too, he dies and just disappears quickly. He decides he wants to make his fortune. How did he make your fortune? Fast in 1650, he went to India with the East India Company. There you made your money. We know he went to India because there's a letter surviving, which is, in fact, of a transit of Mercury seen at Surat in India in 1651. Projected by a telescope, just exactly in Horrocks' fashion, that no more. It was later recorded that Mr. Shackley, quote, died in the East Indies, as many people did, of course, in tropical diseases and so on in those days. But by the time that had happened, he had put so much material about Horrocks, Crabtree, and so on into the wider world. And like I say, you had Jonas Moore as well doing all of his work again, very, very well connected, surveying and so on, and royal connections too. By the time the Royal Society is founded in 1660, it's very, very obvious that Jeremiah Horrocks was in particular was being seen as the founder of British astronomy. They were beginning to think that. And in fact, the Royal Society appointed a committee under the control of a man called Seth Ward, later to become Bishop of Salisbury, to collect together the Horrocks papers and publish them in a volume called Opera Posthuma, 
the posthumous works. Now you think of that. All these early SRSs in the, eight, in the 1660s, all so keen on what's been done by a group of very, very young Lancastrians 20 years before, and say that this is the foundation of British astronomy. And what they were achieving, I think, is so significant. When you think of the great astronomical achievements of that time, Kepler and his laws in, well, based in Prague, Galileo in Florence, and many, many others across Europe, they were all met in major, major public positions to emperors and grand dukes and so on, or great universities, they said Bologna and so on. What are these men? Basically, nobody's in the bogs of Lancashire. How did they achieve it? That is what I find so phenomenal. They were doing work that advanced Kepler, Galileo, and all the great European figures, and they were taking it further. That is what the Royal Society leapt on after 1660. And I think it's why we should be so proud of them. So this creates a tradition. And all of these men were dead. The major ones were dead, certainly by 1650. And it's true that those who'd gone to London, such as Jeremy Shackley, tragically he died in India somewhere in 1651 or 52. And also to Jonas Moore, who lived to a good age in the 1670s. But what about other people? There's very little of significance happening for the next hundred and odd years. In other words, things were fairly quiet here. I would suggest that the first person of any significance, if another major astronomical figure in this part of the world, was Moses Holden. Moses Holden was born in 1777. That's 140 years after Horrocks had died. Or nearly 40 years. Who's Moses Holden? And of course, I know he's the great founder so much in Preston. He was actually not from Preston. He's from Bolton. He's from Bolton. But his family moved to Preston, and he's probably 12 or something like that. And the rest of his life and his career was associated with Preston. He got bitten by the astronomy bug. He received only a fairly rudimentary education, but in that grand, grand tradition, he reads and reads and reads. Luckily, by his time, there was enough stuff in astronomy in English to not have a complete Latin dependence. As a young man, he's good with his hands. He works as a handloom weaver by then. That's his basic job, handloom weaving. Early, early cotton handloom weaving. And then after that, he makes an orrery. A homemade orrery. There were some around there, they were available in London and so on. He makes one in Preston. He had the sun in the middle, the planets, Turn a handle and round they go. And he starts lecturing. He is what you might call Preston's first outreach astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> he does it also for cash. He was actually part of a noble tradition. There were science lecturers touring England at that time, and also very, very getting to all kinds of people. It was also a movement that fitted in with other things. A tremendous wellspring of self-education is beginning in late 17th, late 18th century England. You have the literary and philosophical societies of the gentry. You have the beginnings of what would be called the mechanics institution movement for working men, or occasionally working women. And then in addition to that, another thing you may find puzzling, Sunday schools. Sunday schools first became a big thing in the 1770s. And of course, you think of a Sunday school today as a school where kiddies learned their prayers and their Bible stories and so on. Yes, they had that. But these were largely adult schools. You're a working man. You're nose to the wheel. Six days a week, 12 hours a day. Sunday's your only day off. You go to church in the morning and you go to church to even prayer. And if you want... You can learn to read after service. And then once you've learned to read, you can learn 
but if the books are available. But it's astronomy, great battles, stories and tales, ghost stories, astronomy, geography, the life of Nelson, you name it. You're starting to get an educated artisan class. This, I think, feeds very much into the future. Moses Holden is part of that tradition. Moses Holden becomes a massively successful lecturer and teacher. He also, too, gets into a wide range of people. And in a long life, born in 1777, dies in 1864. He lives into the age of the railway, the steam press, and all the things which we associate with High Victoria. And he uses these at each turn. He becomes, in a way, Preston's intellectual icon. First intellectual icon. He was also a devout Methodist. And that was another key thing. Whether it was Methodist or Anglican or Presbyterian, you name it. The Sunday schools. Now, of course, many of these denominations were not always on good terms with each other. And often on worse terms than in the 17th century. But what tends to happen here is that the Methodists were great promoters of ordinary working folk. Most Methodist preachers were not university men. They were often literally bright lads who'd come up through the ranks. And of course, too, as I've said, if you have somebody, they also played a major, major part in reform movements in the 19th century and some, not Marxist, but good reform movement. As I always say, if you were articulate, and you give room to argue if you could actually hold, as I said, drive the devil back into hell from the pulpit before 3,000 people in a big chapel on a Sunday, then you could argue with bad bosses on Monday morning. <laughs> and many of them often did. Very, very good on Christian grounds and so on. Methodist teachers were very, very influential. Moses Holden was one of them. Methodism was not just about going to church. It was about self-improvement, getting up in society, and even, too, occasionally women preachers as well. You may know a novel, in fact, uh, by uh, Jane Austen, but there's a figure called Dinah Morris. Dinah Morris is a female preacher, what they call a woman preacher. Even they were coming up through the Methodist system. So he's part, therefore, of a wider diaspora of public education and largely at ordinary folk. But he's so good and he's so clever, he makes a good bit of money lecturing even the better off as well. And especially the heavens, which he saw as God's creation and his delight. So I think Moses Holden should be very, very strongly remembered as part of the legacy of this city and a genuine ancestor of Euclid in what he was doing, although not being done from an institutional basis. But by the time that Holden dies in 1866, you're having other things happening in Lancashire too, scientific societies. They'll be coming to these in a few minutes. Let's go back a bit now and look at a few other great Lancashire figures. William Lassell. Now, he was not, as it were, um, South helping the poor. William Lasser was also born in Bolton in 1799. His family owned a timber and building business, so they were what you might call lower middle, middling class. We know he was well educated, he was a Presbyterian, no, sorry, he was a Congregationalist, but we know this because he was a boy who used to attend the Duke's Alley Chapel in Bolton. And his early journal books still survive in the Royal Astronomical Society Library. Now, this was the intellectual training you had. Ten-year-old, or whatever it was, young Laszlo would be taken to chapel on Sunday morning by his parents, listen to the Reverend Mr. So-and-so's sermon, go home, and write it out from memory. That was an intellectual truth. And he did that because his journal book still survived. 
but also he became fascinated by the heavens themselves. He starts to read books that his family eventually end up going to Liverpool. His father dies, his mother is a scouser, and she goes back to Liverpool, taking him as about a 12 year old with her. And William Lassell enters the education community of Liverpool. He also gets part of his education in Rochdale. Did we know that there was a dissenting academy in Rochdale in 1812 15? Dissenting academy means university standard institution that was open to people who were not members of the Church of England. Dissenters. And he attended that. Back to Liverpool. And he enters the business where you simply could not go wrong in the 19th century. Brewing. <laughs> Think of Liverpool, 1820. Canals, docks, early railways, the first Liverpool to Manchester Railways, 1830. Hordes of people pouring in, mainly for some Adam, to all sorts of jobs. And what did they all share in common? They could drink a brewery dry. <laughs> and I can tell you, Lassler gives them plenty of opportunities. He went into partnership with a man called Bangnor and founded the Milton Street Brewery in Liverpool. It was to be what you could only expect, a money spinner. And indeed, he grew very wealthy. Extremely wealthy, in fact. And indeed, he married a lady who was herself of what you might call the merchant aristocracy class in Liverpool, true? And indeed, he starts to make telescopes. He reads the works of Sir William Herschel through the Royal Society. And indeed, he's fascinated by reflecting telescopes. But he asks the question, why is it that, that, that telescopes often tarnish reflectors? It's because, basically, the impure composition of the matter. He starts to experiment with the hot mixes for speculum mirror matter. And he said the problem often is the copper. The copper is often impure. Where do you get the best copper? The breakers yards of old ships. By that meaning wooden ships on the Mersey estuary. In those days you used lots and lots of copper nails in a ship because you would sheath the bottom of the ship in copper plates to prevent woodworm and getting uh, marine worm into the wood. And of course they came to realise if you put iron nails in, copper sheet, iron nail, seawater, electrolytic reaction. How did you stop it? Big copper nails. <laughs> They'd rip these off in the shipyards and he realised that maybe 20 years in the sea had actually had an extraordinary impact on the copper. You've got almost a pure copper. He says this is what he started to use in his early mirrors. He makes a nine inch, but he does more than that. He designs it on a revolutionary type of equatorial money, a thought man. And indeed, he informs the new Royal Astronomical Society, or as it was in the early days, the Astronomical Society of London. Drawings of it survive. It apparently gave breathtaking views of the sky. The mirrors didn't tarnish, and yes, this was it. This was the cat's breakfast. He starts to make key observations and gets known. He quite regularly visits London and of course becomes an early fellow of the RAS and later fellow of the Royal Society. He enters the grand amateur world of London astronomy. And indeed, here he is, later of course the railway had come in to use, easier than to get to London, absolutely by train easily. All of a sudden, he's making major discoveries. But unlike Herschel, Lassell isn't really interested in deep space. The planets fascinate him. The planets at high magnification, and especially Saturn. What are Saturn's rings made of? And also, too, searching for moons going around the outer planets. His superb telescope 
give him data, otherwise unobtainable. And then what does every astronomer want? A bigger telescope. <laughs> and now he sets about building a spectacular upgrade. 24 inch mirror, 20 feet photal length, giant equatorial. And how did you control its movement? Well, indeed, he mentions what we might call boy power. <laughs> Not an engine, but you have a local light, comes in your observatory, pay maybe a shilling for the night, and you have a like a real wheel point lever. Right, lad, do that at the right speed. Click, 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 click. Do it at the right rate, and you can track. And you just shout at the job. And indeed, with that, he makes even more wonderful things. Shortly after it came into use, in 1846, Lassell's second telescope was the first place in Britain to spot the newly discovered planet Neptune. Seen in Berlin about a week before. Gets into the English newspapers, and as soon as he got the coordinates from Berlin, the first clear night in Liverpool, whoosh, on it goes. Not only does he see Neptune, not as a point of light, but he says, shining like a half crown in his new giant telescope. He also even thought he had a ring, although we now know that the ring is not the case. He also discovered the first view, he had a satellite as well. These are major, major, major astronomical discoveries. Built by a man, a John by a man, who was the Liverpool Brewer. The grand amateur tradition at its noblest. But also, too, Lasser had a great friend in Patricroft, Ettles, which is two miles from where I come from. This is a Scotsman. This was James Naismith. Now, Nesmith is quite a lad in his own right. Nesmith was the son of a very successful Alexander Nesmith, famous Edinburgh painter. The man who was a father, in many ways, a Scottish landscape painting. Young Nesmith was brought up in a large house in fashionable downtown Edinburgh. He also made money as a boiler. Not only did his parents pay for him to go to school, he had a sharp commercial nose. He loved steam engines and made model ones. We're talking here 18, 18, 1820. Made model steam engines and sold them to his schoolmates. <laughs> you know, he was all that. He went to Edinburgh University, then I went to do a full scale article ship to a major, major engineering firm in London. And then also to decide he'd found his own business. He comes to Manchester, but at that time was the hub of engineering innovation in England. He actually starts manufacturing machinery, particularly his beloved steam engines. He rents a disused warehouse for his early factory, the second floor. Then he has an accident. He's revving up one of his engines for test, and it goes through the floor. <laughs> the man who had the area down below was a sheet glass manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> That's when he got the idea of moving up. He obtains a land, a piece of land in Patricroft, which he says was perfectly served. The newly built Liverpool to Manchester Railway on one side. The canal on the other, and the Irwell River. In other words, perfectly served for transport on three sides. Boo! Coal, heavy stuff, and so on. And he could get his engines to Liverpool for export. He even built 20 full scale, seven foot gauge railway locomotives for Brunel's new Great Western Railway. They would have to be taken to Liverpool. Shipped to Bristol, where the only nearest seven foot gauge track was available. In fact, we're told that Brunel was so pleased with his engines, he gave Naismith 20 guinea bonus for each engine. 
Not bad going. 20 guinea bonus for each. Each entry costs about 500 pounds to work. Anyway, he's also bitten by the astronomy bug. He had been to childhood. In fact, his father was a great friend of the great physicist in, physicist in Edinburgh, Sir David Brewster. Well, you can't do better than a friend for that. He said that Bruce would often come and visit them at their house and have dinner with the family. No, oh, oh, you know, he's with Brewster, the great, great scientist. And his father owned a three-inch telescope. And he says he remembers being shown the moon by Sir David Brewster. Well, oh, oh, that really bits you in astronomy. He's making a lot of money at Patricroft. And like, he becomes literally filthy rich. As of engineering. And that's the steam hammer, the most famous thing, of course, he's, he's attributed to that. But then, what is he doing that? He also wants a bigger telescope. <laughs> and he casts, he knows Lassa very well in Liverpool, and the two men are great friends by this turn. He casts a superb 20 inch mirror in his factory. Now, you think here, when you've got one of Europe's most advanced engineering factories next door, because you own it, well, what can't you build? <laughs> he produced superb mirrors. I think, too, he may have built the machine that finally gave the perfect luster to Lassell's telescopes as well. The two men were very, very close friends. They dined together, went to London together, all sorts of things. But what's Naismith's real astronomical interest? The moon. He is one of the great pioneer lunar observers. Not somebody who just drew the moon or mapped the craters. That wasn't his interest. What fascinated him was the moon's geology. Because he was also a skilled amateur geologist. And as a iron merchant, he was aware that when you had the great, what they call kibbles, the boiling, boiling vats of iron, the surface would often develop a sort of scum, a scurrier. And he was often, how similar this looked to the moon's surface. Had the moon once been molten, and had the craters been formed by impact or by volcanic eruption from below, and also too, have features such as the flooded seas and craters like Plato, which are flooded, were these all indicators of ancient lunar volcanism. Lunar volcanism becomes his great, great passion. He draws the comes of Actually, he's an artist by original training. He's a superb draftsman, not just in the moon in general, but also particularly of detailed features. He also does a brilliant experiment. Why, when you have creatures like Aristarchus, with the great rays coming out, why do they produce rays? Could this be caused by, a, a, as it were, a, a temperature differential between the hot interior of the moon and the colder mantle? And he does an experiment. Now he's rich, he has all the resources he needs, and he can try experiments which are utterly destructive. He has made a glass sphere, perfect sphere. He has inside it water. He starts to heat it and notices that the differential between the glass and the hot water causes cracks. And the cracks are pss, pss. And he actually publishes an engraving of this sphere with its radiant, he says, this is what must have happened on the moon. It must have been a differential of temperature between the hot interior and the cooling mantra. This is being done by an engineer just outside Manchester in the 1840s. Not bad girl. Well, he's really wanting to retire. He's 40. He wants to retire. He's made more money than he does in Tira. He says, by the time he finally got there to retire when he was 48 years old, he does this. He takes out an enormous sum of money from the business, but leaves a quarter of a million in the business. 
a quarter of a million in the money of 1852. Which, of course, kept him on the board and kept the revenues coming in. He retires to Penshurst in Kent. Well, his near neighbour is Sir John Herschel. They all knew each other through the RAS and so on. And there he continues his living work. This is another man who is not a Lancashire man by birth, but certainly makes his fortune, his money, and his reputation in Lancashire, James Nesson. Yet these two men, Lassell and Naismith, not only knew each other, they also had another friend at Ormskirk, William Rutter, Dr. William Rutter Dawes. Who is Dr. Dawes? Well, in fact, his background was a fascinating one. His dad and his family were Royal Navy officers. And indeed, dad had done survey work in Australia. And there is a point doors at the entrance to Sydney Harbour, which was named in honour of his dad, because his dad had an observatory on that side. Young William Rutter is sent to Eton. Through gentleman's education, and he... But then he gets kicked out of Eton, expelled in disgrace. And of course, Eton College, just like the Oxford and Cambridge Colleges at that time, was utterly, totally, and exclusively Anglican. And he had become fascinated by another dissenting group, the Congregationalists. And a naughty, naughty little boy had gone slinking off to worship with the Congregationalists in their chapel rather than down market for a well-born gentleman. This gets to the headmaster, and he's kicked out. <laughs> what do you do? He'd plan on becoming an Anglican clergyman. Well, his other passion was science. He's enrolled at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London to train as a doctor. He then becomes Dr. Dawes. We're talking here of about 1830. You needed to buy a practice when you were a doctor, and he found one that was going fairly cheap, a nice one, at Ormskirk in Lancashire. He had no prior Lancashire connections at all. So he becomes a doctor in Ormskirk. There too, he starts to worship with the local Congregationalist chapel. I mean, a highly educated man and well connected socially, they invite him to become their minister. <laughs> So he becomes medic and minister in Ormskirk. He was also a great friend of a Mr. Wellesby, the richest solicitor in the town. He dealt with a lot of the commercial business for the local farms and so on. Well, Mr. Wellesby died and left a very attractive widow. <laughs> Dawes marries the lady. He gets a very, very handsome cut of money from her, in addition to what he had from his own family. This enables him to pursue his real passion, the sky. He buys large aperture refracting telescopes, mainly from the new rising up and coming optician of the day. This is in America, and this is the great, great collector, Alvin Clark. He buys a collection of Clark telescopes. He can easily and happily pay £250 for an object glass from Clark. £250! Many a country clergyman would give his right arm for that for an entire salary for his year. It's a lot of money. An ordinary working person would be earning about £40 to £50 a year. He's well off. And also, it so happens that he was also a congregationist, William Lassen, and the two men have a religious as well as a scientific friendship. Um, Naismith seems to have had no particularly religious views, but nonetheless, they form a happy group between them. What is Dawes interested in? Double stars and variable stars. Why do these stars vary? And in particular, binary and triple systems. What are the complex dynamics in Newtonian physics that make them do this? This is his passion. 
working with a micrometer and with a very, very large private refractor. And this is the work that he does, but done in Lancashire, done at Orbiscope. So these are three very, very grand amateurs, interested in their own different parts of the solar of the universe, the moon, the planets, and the geometry of distant space. They died together, and of course, to this grand amateur world would have met in Manchester and in London. The RAS would have been their base, along with the Athenaeum Gentlemen's Club on Pall Mall. Very, very nice. They would have met John Herschel and lots of their other chums. And this lovely, easy conviviality they had together. Now, in addition to that, we don't get to Moses Holdren. Moses Holden, as he gets older, he inspires so much of astronomy in this part of the world. And in 1876, ten years after Holden died, was founded the Preston Scientific Society. Give me all the sciences, very special time, Cardiff had one too. And very, very rapidly, they developed their own specialist division, botany, geology, astronomy. And it was out of that society that the Cardiff Astronomical Society, that the Preston Astronomical Society, would later be found them. In that society, too, you had an observatory established. This was the first Deepdale Observatory, 1881. Another great thing about this whole movement was taking their learning to the public. Outreach was the key. Look, you'd have serious science on the one hand, then out to the public on the other. Deepdale had viewing nights for the public. And of course, this would lead to the founding of a great, great interest in astronomy in Preston. Then, of course, in 1927, the great eclipse, the total eclipse. For this, it was thought. The corporation was putting money to Preston, Preston Corporation was putting money into that event. And the Deep Yale Observatory was by this time a bit defunct. The telescope was moved to Moore Park, and the founding of the Moore Park Observatory in Preston in 1927. To coincide with the great total eclipse of that year. And I have a photograph showing Moore Park taken from the roof of the newly finished observatory with a sea of faces right across the park of people who had turned out to watch the eclipse of 1927. Now my mother, 40 miles, 30 odd miles to the south, in Swinton and Penderbury, always said that she remembered seeing the eclipse of 1927. She would have been 14 at the time. And she had an observing technique, along with her dad and one of their friends, which would make anybody cringe today. She said, we got up early that morning, because I may say it was virtually a dawn eclipse. It's very early on the summer's morning. So we're talking here about 5 a.m. You've got bits of broken windows, lit candles, and smoked bits of glass. And look... <laughs> You imagine doing that nowadays, smoke glass. How many of the people on those photographs in Moore Park, I wonder, have their own little bits of glass looking like that. But this was another great piece of outreach. And of course, the Moore Park Observatory was to be a major, major resource in this city. It has now been refurbished and reopened. 1957 saw the founding of the Wilfrid Hall Observatory, with a spectacular refractor. And of course, now Newtown has its own splendid, I think it's something like 75 centimeter great telescope in there as well, doing fundamental research as well as outreach. Now, all of this brings over how very central Lancashire is to so much of this. Now, like I say, if you put all of these people together, J.M.I. Horrocks, Shackley, uh, Lassell, Naismith, and so on, I don't know of any one other single county in England where so much astronomical activity is happening. 
Now, if you explain it perhaps more in the 19th century, the 19th century industry, engineering, oh, yes, lots and lots and lots of ingenious people being brought in. But it's very hard to explain people like Jeremiah Horrocks and even Moses Holden in the late 18th century. But what I think one has to bear in mind is that you have a great, or oh, we have, as a Lancastrian myself, a great, great deal to be proud of. Lancashire has a tremendous richness in astronomy for discovery, for research, and for outreach. I, of course, too, was honoured last year when uh, Vincent Barocas died that the PADAS, the Preston and District Astronomical Society, invited me to become its next honorary president. And I think that's quite a tradition to work in, in the wake of Vin Barocas. But we have so much to be proud of, because Lancashire has become a, a shadow of doubt over 400 years, a major, major place for astronomy. So literally, quite simply, you could truly say it has been to the stars from Pendle Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'll try to my pictures, please. Shall we show, show some slides? Yes, please. We'll show a couple of slides. Now, I don't know how to do this. I'm a Neanderthal with electronics. <laughs> Have this uh, little drink. It's the magic lantern, Alan. Better, yes, uh, especially with you light with a, with a taper. <laughs> this is a Horrocks window in Hull Parish Church. I first saw that when I was about 70 or 80. Can we dim, please? Oh, I love it. The window is about 1860. I may say to you that Moses Holden was a major, major figure in securing the first Horrocks Memorial in Hull Parish Church. This one, please. This is another one, too. Some psalm. 119, the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The transit of Venus, 1639 to 2004. And I saw the transit of Venus, like I say, its ingress and its egress from Preston. Yes, okay. The painting in Manchester Town Hall of Crabtree observing the transit from Manchester. The observing technique is exactly the same. Yeah, we had to bear in mind at the time, the real Crabtree was 34. He looks 90. <laughs> but I suppose the artist thought it made it look more dramatic. <laughs> he was only 34. Moses Holden, very, very much looking the very, very influential Methodist minister that he was. Yes, something. This is William Lassup a picture owned by the Liverpool Astronomical Society, and a very, very early photograph. That is a daguerreotype photograph of about 1850, when Lassen would have been about, about 50 or something. And in 1996, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the discovery of Neptune, a perfect working replica of this great 20-inch, 20-foot telescope is built. And I was the historical advisor to the project. That is the telescope as it was in 1996. It works, but it does not yet have full optics. There's one here. Now, of course, last time we had an even bigger telescope, which is the Moltab. This has a 48-inch mirror. Notice a very, very early skeleton tube to keep down the heat. And again, boy powered round here. <laughs> Century box for altitude. But that was apparently beautiful, beautiful, gentle tracking. The nearest telescope in size to that bigger was Lord Ross's in Ireland. But Lord Ross's telescope was very, very limited in its movements. 
That could be brought to any part of the sky perfectly. Yes, some people. This is James Nason. Now, this is from his autobiography. He looks very avuncular, very sort of nice. Oh, oh, Uncle James. The photograph from which it's taken. Well, my wife Rachel, who doesn't mince her words, said that from the photograph it's taken, he looks an odd bugger. <laughs> <laughs> he does. And you, know, you can just imagine Nay Smith as a, is a tough customer. But the face softened for the memorial picture. <laughs> yes, some people. This is Fireside at Patricot, with this great telescope in the garden, the lovely house here. I may say, Nasmith became the subject of a lovely ghost story. He discovered that the barges, because the barges went past the bottom of his gun, of the, 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 the Liverpool Canal, it, a story was passing that his gardens were haunted by a ghost carrying its own coffin. When he heard this, he burst out laughing. So sometimes on a summer's night, as it is clear, he get up and go and observe in his nightshirt. <laughs> he take a telescope to screw onto a friend. <laughs> but the barge you thought it was a ghost. But it was Nesmith in his nice shirt with a telescope. <laughs> yes, sir. That's his spectacular 20 inch of 20 feet photo land. Yes, sir, and this is one of his drawings. But more than a drawing. That crater is not the real crater. In his day, it was impossible to photograph the moon to high level of accuracy. The emulsions were too slow. And indeed, the artist as he was, he made perfect plaster cast models of the key lunar formations. About a foot square in white plaster. Many of them still survive in the Science Museum in London today. And then he would have that photograph with the light in the right angles. So that is not a photograph of a lunar crater, that's a photograph of a plaster model of a lunar crater. You can see the artistry that went into that. Yes, on to William Ruffin Dawes, very, very, he was known as the Eagle Eyed Dawes, the Eagle Eyed Dr. Dawes. Yes, on to Throw out of Eden. And another great institution, too. Stonyhurst Observatory, also to near Pendleton. Stonyhurst was founded again as an institution for English Catholic gentlemen. And in 1838, they had their first astronomical observatory. And it had, right from the word go, by 1848, one of the most leading astronomers in Europe in charge of it. This was Father Angelo Secce the pioneer spectroscopist, director of the Vatican Observatory in Rome. What was he doing then? <laughs> Following the revolutions in Italy at that time, and the sheer chaos and the anti-Jesuit, anti-church party, he got out of Italy. Where was he given a warm welcome? England. He goes to Stonyhurst, already a Jesuit foundation and teaches the latest physics and astronomy to the young Catholic gentleman of Stonyhurst. And he went to America, and when things calmed down in Italy, he returned there too. But yes, you'd had this great, great Jesuit astronomer teaching there in the 1850s. Then later, there would be Walter Sidgreaves, Father Perry, and a whole succession of other leading Jesuit astronomers working there. Pioneering on the one hand, spectroscopy, the new science of the 19th century, and the other one too, geomagnetism, the subtle changes of the Earth's magnetic field. And I understand that particularly geomagnetism and meteorology are still recorded at Stonyhurst. That's the later observatory, that's the 1866 bigger observatory. There's one piece. This is Angelo Secchi. It was he who invented the first classification of five classes of stars based on spectroscopic criteria. 
It was very popular in England. It was often invited to attend British Association for the Advancement of Science meetings and so on. That's what I'm telling you. Liverpool Astronomical Society, 1881. The first, I would suggest, purely astronomy society as opposed to a broader scientific society. That is their, uh, basically, it's their logo. Meaning, of course, if, it shine, if, it, if it's up there, we look at it. If it's up there, we look at it. Seek eternal and astra. It is the stars. 1881. There's something. And this is deep down in about, probably about 1890. Next one. And of course here we see Moor Park. The early Moor Park after 1927. This one. Modern photograph of Moor Park. There's something. And also to the observatory at Manchester. On the top of the old Humis building at Manchester, Manchester University didn't have an observatory society, but it did actually have a town society coming out of the new BAA branch. And in 1903, <coughs> Manchester established its own first astronomical society. They still use the observatory up there on the top of Umist. Magnificent observatory, right on top of the building. There's something. You might say, though, what about him? Bernard Lovell. Bernard Lovell held the chair, the first chair in ra radio astronomy at Manchester University. And of course, it made him a Lancashire astronomer. <laughs> now it's true, next one please. This is just over the Cheshire border, Georgia Bank. But the reason why they voted it there is that the University of Manchester already had a scientific test ground at John Drummond, and hence they built the new telescope there after 1957. Although you can see the John Drummond dish from the top of Salford University. I have seen it across the country. You can't quite see it from a new club, but you can certainly see it from Salford University. And so, yes, you may say that although it's in Cheshire, it's doing work for a Lancashire institution, and also to the fundamental work that Lovell did was in Manchester University. That's quite a history when you think of it. From Jeremiah Horrocks to Bernard Lovell. What a rich, rich tradition of astronomy. I think that's the last one. And yeah, back to Horrocks, a wonderful, wonderful picture of Horrocks. Could I have the lights, please? Thank you. Photographs taken of that eclipse from 1927, and also of the thousands, the photograph of the thousands of people Absolutely. In That's just a part, yep. who'd all got up early in order to, to watch the eclipse. Uh, in addition, you can come to, on the first Wednesday of every month, you can come to our Alston uh, Observatory yep. through, through the winter months that, that, uh, that Alan mentioned, uh, and actually look through our 70 centimeter telescope, if it's clear, um, which we named the Moses Holden telescope yes, yep. uh, after our founder, um, and in actual fact, um, in gratitude, his four great grandson has endowed a Moses Holden scholarship. Us, uh, the first holder of which is uh, currently observing through a telescope in the Canary Islands this week. <laughs> So, uh, or he would have been here tonight as, 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 yep. as well. Um, and as further generosity, this chap is called Patrick Holden, has actually bequeathed to us uh, the, the original portrait oh. of, of Moses Holden, which is now in 
the university archives and uh, will be displayed in a suitable, suitable venue uh, in, across, uh, in, the univer in the university. So uh, that will be available Wonderful. To, to see as well. I know you must have plenty of questions for yep. Alan. Yep, any, any, any I, I'm a little bit deaf, so if you can shout them, please. I'll repeat them to you, Alan. No Thank problem. you. <laughs> Yeah. We're told in a note surviving from Crabtree that, and I think it was the 3rd of January, 1641, Mr. Horrocks was coming to visit me and he died. <laughs> <laughs> he then finishes it off with a short quotation from Horrocks, from, from the Roman poet Horace, Hinc ele lacrimae. Thus the tears fall. Hink ele lacrimae, just, we just know that he died. What a young man died of, we don't know. It was winter, he was probably on a horse. Did he fall off the horse and break his neck? Who knows? We don't even know where he was buried or anything. It must have been yes. something sudden, because he wouldn't have undertaken yes. a journey Absolutely. like yep. that yep. if he'd been ill. Yep. You say, I did that he died of TB. No idea if that was what. And it was undertaking a journey from Liverpool to Salford in the depths of winter. I suspect he was quite strong. And my suspicion is it was accident. Very bad, you see, with Horrocks, had he not died, born 1618, 1619, he could have become a founding fellow of the Royal Society. He could have died in, let's say, 1690. He could have known Newton. He certainly influenced Newton. Newton actually acknowledges Horrocks in Principia. That what he would have been had he lived another 20, 30, 50 years as anybody. But he was no more than about 22. But he, at the beginning of his 22nd year, then he died. Yes. That's correct. How did the manuscript get from Good question. Well, it seemed to be past published through friends in Cambridge. It was published by Johannes Hevelius, the great, great astronomer in dancing. But you imagine, an astronomer in dancing, who's also, I may say, a brewer, he made all of his fortune in brewing. <laughs> Has he heard of a Lancashire teenager? Like I say, news spread in a way that we often don't think. And my suspicion is, is that somebody in Cambridge had passed this into the European scientific network and he'd got that. And somehow or other he had acquired a copy. I may say to you some years ago, a handwritten copy came available of Horrocks' manuscript. Now, I forget where he was born, but I was asked by the auctioneers to authenticate him. And it was a real manuscript of Venus in Soli Visa, Venus seen upon the sun. And I suspect that when, in the days before the photocopier, you would have had a scribe to do copies. And I suspect copies when we said Paris, uh, Bologna, dancing, that's hit the bat. Goodness knows how many copies there may be in the Vatican archives or somewhere like that, <laughs> circulated around Europe. Yeah? Vatican yep. Observatory by a very bizarre coincidence. On Monday, we are um, expecting a, a rather important visitor to come to visit the, uh, the observatory at Austin, no less than the director of the Vatican Observatory himself. So we're very flattered. Who is it then? Um, guy, um, brother Guy. No, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. the memory of Alan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, come, he'll come back to me. I've been to the Vatican Observatory, it's superb. So I'll, the, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll ask him if we can, if we can have a copy of Horrocks. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Strange coincidence, that, but he started mentioning that. Oh, yeah, he's coming on Monday. Yes, the, the one I used to was Father Courting. It's Father Courting. Yeah. I know he studies meteors, meteorites. The name's coming to the tip of my tongue. 
Tak. So, can, 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 he said he won't sleep tonight. Oh, oh no, no, <laughs> that's asleep. I won't be able to write it all down. <laughs> can I just add one thing? So I brought my group here. Yes, sir. Astronomical. Oh, Southport Astronomical Society. Oh, oh, well, welcome. Well, 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 some of us are. Most of us are from the youth ray in Southport. I'm of the Southport. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, as we drove here today, tonight, um, we passed. The church in Montreal. Much hill, yes. Of course. We've actually been there. And a little bit further on, past Carlton, where the, the junction turns. Yes. Out, uh, you've got the hall where he lived. At yes. The time. Is it gentleman the first who lives there? The, the, the man who lives there today is also <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yeah, because I've, I've got this idea, actually, of doing uh, following in the, in the, the, the footsteps. Yes. Yes, sir. Yep, yep. He wants to be invited for dinner. <laughs> Where he actually observed the Venus yep. I suspect, up in the loft. Yes. Because that is the only way he gets a view to the west. Yes. Yep. If it is possible, I thought it was the first floor drawing room. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's now a bedroom. It's now a bedroom, yes. The first floor window. Yeah. Well, that's where he lived. That's it. Just to the right. That's it. This man's been stalking you. And finally, might I just say that in Southport, in the Hester Park, we have a cooked telescope. Yes, another uh, the public telescope, yep. In 1901. Yep. Built in 1869. Yep. Yes. Um, Great I, Victorian tradition. Yep. Uh, two years later, a Methodist minister came to take over the church on Leyland Road. He was keen on the strong uh, and had his own impact as well. So inevitably, he took over charge of that because the council yep. had no idea what to do with it. Yep. So he took it over and he was the first operational manager of it. He joined the local uh, uh, Philosophical Society, and after his death in 1927, coincidentally, they part of them broke away and founded the South Astronomical Society. And I finally, excellent, I am the current operational manager of that observatory. Wonderful. All that time. Everything you said, you said, and I'm impressed. Your, yep. your, your cook refractor is, a, is a sister instrument. To yep. the cook refactor we have in the Moore Park yep. Observatory. Yes, and, yes. And similar and age. Yours has That's been refurbished. Yeah. Ours was refurbished two years, a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so we're going to go to see that as well. That's a much. We're going to Godley on the 5th of October. Yep. You said the Godley, of course, the oh, Manchester Godley. Yep, yep. But yes, I mean, it's interesting to do the Methodist minister. You find everywhere yes. clergy. Anglican, Roman Catholic, Methodist, Congregationalist, they're everywhere in this room. Yep. Yes, 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 yes. I may also mention too, you may wonder how in 1638 the easiest way would be to get from Liverpool to Much Hoor. The county is a bug. I think at low tide, ride your horse on the sand dunes all the way around. <laughs> yeah. All the way up. Because you look at it, it's all sand. Because going past what would later be Southport and some all the way around. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. So I mean, feel free to stay and, 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 and ask Alan Alan questions in, informally if you like. But I think it, it's now eight o'clock. We should probably bring the formal part of the evening uh, to a close. Um,
I think I think you, you, you'll all agree with me that uh, that we've, we've finished with a bang this week, uh, and that's most certainly been most entertaining as Thank well you. as highly educational. Thank you. Thank all. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And carry on the great Lancashire tradition. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Just before you go, I do just want to say a couple of thanks myself. Uh, thanks to uh, Nula, who's not here this evening, uh, but who's behind the scenes and made all the arrangements that made this week work for the <laughs> Let's give him a round of That's well, he's, he's the cat. It's really not. <laughs> when I was trying to remember the name myself, <laughs> I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Lovely to 